and, and, and I refused. And the moment I refused, I suddenly felt I was across a giant body, not a chasm from, from middle class America, from the US government. I was alienated from all my friends who supposedly understood. I was alienated from the peace movement who supposedly were supporting resistance. You know, here I said, well, well, wait a minute. If you're supporting resistance, why don't you support me? Because I'm resisting. I'm not going. In this unprecedented war, there is no honor for American heroes, just victims. The dead and injured GIs are victims, just as we are. America, right now, has reached a consensus in opposition to the American war policy. We were the ones that began initiating this consensus. Why should we be the ones that are punished? At that time, it was, uh, and still right now, it was part of my religious convictions, you know, for not going over. And uh, I just couldn't. I, I'm up here because of the war in Vietnam and U.S. involvement in, Viet in Indochina. And to go back before the U.S. is out is negating why I came up here. And I'm not about to do that. These inductees were 10 years old when President Johnson was elected on a platform stating that no American boy would be sent 8,000 miles to die in Vietnam. Since then, 8 million have answered the call, of whom over 55,000 have died and 300,000 wounded. You're going to be with us approximately four to seven days. During this four to seven days, you have much processing that you must complete. You will have people who will help you with this process. Most of these men enlisted voluntarily, but a large number might not have, except for the threat of up to five years in jail for refusing induction to the armed forces. Services that have been plagued by desertion, dissent, drugs and racial problems, fighting the longest war in American history. The Army has tried to compensate for the abrupt change from civilian to military life. There are many things that you are entitled to by virtue of being a military individual. If you have a problem, bring that problem to our attention. We can help you solve it. There hasn't been a problem brought to us in the past that we have not been able to solve. Bring your problem to us. Remember this point. We can help you if we know you need help. Somebody in the Army can do it for you. But even with the best of intentions, the Army has had little time to attend to the personal problems of its men. It was still more difficult to handle the problems of conscience as dissent overflowed from public debate and found voice and action within the ranks. 10,000 draftees refused to fight and are now convicted felons. An estimated 35,000 still await indictment or trial. Deserters comprise the majority of those 35,000 to 100,000 who are in exile. A relatively sizable number remain underground. If you add to that men with less than honorable discharges, you have at least half a million men who are affected, plus their families. Many people working through councils of churches and individual churches abroad help with the humanitarian aspects through aid centers in principal cities, a movement exemplified by the Toronto Anti-Draft Program. Where are you from? New York, New York City. What base did you 
Now, the talk of amnesty has intensified the frustrations and hopes of those in exile. Even before immigration was stopped in November 1972, the counselors spent as much time dealing with those who wished to return as they did with those who wished to stay. The whole situation in Canada has changed, so the counseling has changed. Um, we do something that we call priority counseling, which is basically um, making people aware of their alternatives. Uh, there was a time where TADP encouraged just about everybody to come here and immigrate. That's no longer the case. Most, the majority, the overwhelming majority are deserters. We still see a few people with draft delinquency, uh, but they're gradually, in terms of percentages, becoming a smaller number than prior. The deserters are the main number we see. Although American resistors are spread out across Canada, they do have a central forum where their hopes and grievances can be aired. Amex Canada magazine, published by exiles in Canada, came into existence in 1968 at the University of Toronto. The magazine now plays a leading role in the amnesty debate from the exile perspective. Dee Knight, formerly of San Francisco, is the managing editor. He feels the majority of exiles are politically motivated. There's over 100,000 people, young Americans, many of us intelligent, and very committed people, committed to changing the world, uh, who are exiled in Canada or Sweden or France and many other places around the world. You know? You think that uh, many of the people up here, supposedly 100,000, 50,000, are assimilating it? Of course. I've been here now for three and a half years. And uh, when I came here, the vast majority were draft resistors. Many of us hung around uh, places like the old Union of American Exiles or other hostels or meeting places, wondering what's going to happen, who's going to take control of our lives now. And uh, people waited and waited and didn't get jobs and didn't do anything, just waited for something to change. And pretty soon, they realized that the only person that can control their lives is number one, they themselves. And then they go out and get jobs. Then you find them no longer associating only with Americans in Canada, uh, going about their lives as if they belong to them, rather than waiting for the American government to uh, reclaim them. We don't have time, you know, to wait for it. After a year or two, a person gets himself settled. Uh, hopefully, uh, a person still uh, remains honest to himself and remembers why he came here in the first place. Although many war resistors quickly found a place for themselves in the Canadian community with jobs as teachers and in business, others experienced extremes of loneliness and disorientation when they arrived. Wellesley House, operated by deserters, is one such attempt to meet these stresses. Jerry Hughes and Jeff Anger have lived here for the past year, helping other deserters with their problems. Well, what is the purpose exactly of Wellesley House? Well, that's what it is primarily. It's the house that American uh, draft dodgers and deserters come to when they first come to Canada. It's a cheap place to stay and a place to, uh, you know, get their shit together, as they say back in the Army, you know, to get landed, to get some kind of roots in, in Canada, get a job, and uh, also to be in contact with other people who are going through and you know, have gone through much of what they have to go through. You have to retain your identity. You know, you're still an American, and it's nice to retain some sort of cohesion with the people, you know, who are like you. You're the other Dodgers and deserters. And I think the only function is of Wellesley House is to be sort of a stepping stone on into Canadian life. When you join the military, you sworn oath to defend your country. How do you justify breaking that oath? You don't go uh, and uh, do something which you consider wrong because sometime in the past you took an oath to do that. Some people uh, find the Army a very radicalizing, eye-opening experience. I did. And, uh, you know, once I got in there and found out that uh, duty, honor, and country meant participating in a system which was impressing people, 
for two years of service and asking them to give up their God-given right to life, you know, like the Declaration of Independence says, to go over and kill people for no reason. When I found out that, you know, that oath meant it didn't mean shit to me anymore. The United States has got some perverse sense of pride that they would rather go on massacring people rather than admit the colossal blunder they made in Vietnam. And to me, this is insanity, and <laughs> I would do the same thing again. I have, you know, no doubts about that, although I would like to live in the United States. I'm glad to be gone. I have no desire to return. I would like to see my family, you know, and I would like to be able to return. But I, I you know, there's, there's no desire for me to, on my part, to go back and rejoin American society. An extensive study of the psychological difficulties facing war exiles has been made by Dr. Saul Levine, a psychiatrist in residence at a Toronto hospital. It's a tremendous stress. They are removed from their home, from their loved ones, uh, from a very familiar culture, and thrust into an alien environment. And, and if, if they came up with uh, no contacts, and no preparation, um, and with false expectancies of what is going to happen up here, a lot of them come up here very suddenly without adequate preparation, not ready for the Canadian scene, not ready for antagonism from Canadians, not ready for uh, being thrust in a kind of lifestyle that they may not be used to. They just go through a very stressful period, and some of them see it as a, a time that suicide becomes one alternative. Antisocial behavior is another. Serious depression is, a, is another. Eddie Hillier came to Toronto in 1970. For an entire year, he, like many others, lived underground for fear he wouldn't qualify for immigrant status and would be sent back to the States and the stockade. Eddie is one of the 10 to 20,000 exiles who are living underground in Canada, cut off from legal and visible means of support, totally transient. I quit school. And like I was ready for the draft. I just couldn't wait to get in. I lied because I wanted to go in. I, I was afraid I was going to be a reject. But I got in, you know. I found out that I screwed myself. And I didn't know how to get out. I thought, like, Canada was the way to escape what I couldn't, what I couldn't handle. But it's just the way that I feel I want to go back, you know? And yet I don't want to go back because I know what's going to happen when I do. Go to jail and sit there and just rot for a while. It could be better if I went back. I'd be fed three times a day, you know? Money wouldn't be any problem because I wouldn't need it in the jail. I'm just getting tired of panhandling and not eating three meals a day and losing weight. These men have little hope for the future without an amnesty. Dick Burles, a native of El Paso, Texas, came to Canada in 1969. Like many others, his local draft board rejected him without giving legal reasons. Being rejected for his beliefs by his family and friends, as well as by the local draft board, he found it a painful and disillusioning experience. Nobody would listen. I had to sit for hours and say the same thing over and over again to drum it into my mother's head that I wasn't trying to destroy a family or anything, that I was merely trying to make a decision on my own that I thought was correct. Somewhere along the line, I think about in January, I changed from going into the jail to uh, coming to Canada. And I, it was very easy once I found out about Canada because I saw no point in going into the into jail for laws that aren't, aren't just. At the Pentagon, Colonel Victor D. Fiore of the Office of the Assistant Secretary of Defense talks about the problems of desertion and claims only a small number of deserters are motivated by anti-war feelings. Generally, you'll find men departing because of personal, family, or financial problems. 
perhaps romantic entanglements, perhaps an, an inability to adjust to the military situation. Some will leave uh, because they are uh, about to be disciplined for some reason. A small number will leave because they are aliens who are either disenchanted with the United States or the U.S. military and wish to go home. A small number, a very small number, perhaps in the neighborhood of four and a half percent or so, leave because of political or anti-Vietnam reasons. At the present time, how many men does the Pentagon have listed as deserters? The total number of military deserters is slightly over 35,000. Uh, those who have gone to foreign countries uh, number about 2,200. Where are the rest of the men? Uh, I have to say, presumably, uh, they're in the United States. At this time, bad luck went through our magazine load. The feeling among GIs of the uselessness or even the wrongness of the war is a leading factor, exiles claim, in the high desertion rate. At Fort Dix, Drill Sergeant Thomas B. Croner, an Army veteran of 17 years, sees it from a different angle. Yeah, they've got their own beliefs today. These beliefs sometimes conflict with, you know, modern day policies. I don't really feel that any man should take it on his own. I mean, there are ways, that, you know, constitutional ways, there are ways of expressing this himself here. He doesn't have to leave as a form of protest. Like I say, I could care less what the man really thinks, right? I do feel that any man has some obligation to someone. Now, whether that is to himself or to his, his family, to his nation, whatever he wants to relate it to. And I don't think running is an answer. You're a Vietnam veteran, is that correct? Yes, I am. The best thing I can say is I've, I've been there. A lot of us have been there. Okay, true, maybe some people don't like it. I don't say I like it. I'm not going to say, you know, that I like going into a situation like that, right? But I've been there and I've seen with my own eyes. Oh, they have too. They've gone over and they have, uh, they've had people of their own over there, you know, and they always relate to picking out whatever, you know, they can about different things that have happened over there. But I've seen more to support what action was taken over there. Even though some people today think it's, uh, you know, a wasteless thing or a useless thing. But not all men who went to Vietnam found it so easy to say, I've been there. Jerry Samuels enlisted out of a deep sense of patriotism. But once in Vietnam, he quickly discovered a great gap between his expectations and the reality he faced. Uh, uh, I don't know exactly what happened or what caused the first shot to be fired, but uh, after a while, when I was trying to contain a few of the villagers myself in, in the crowd, I started hearing rifle fire, M16 fire, short bursts, a couple long bursts, uh, and a few Vietnamese every now and then would, would hit the dirt, you know. And uh, in the excitement, I, uh, I pulled the trigger a couple times myself and uh, blew down a couple, couple women, a couple men. Um, it started to quiet down after a while, and uh, there was a a couple of the GIs, including a, a sergeant, was uh, leading a couple of the Vietnamese girls away from the area where the activity was and uh, outside the village wires. They had uh, razor wire around the village. And uh, there was four or five GIs. And, uh, I don't know if the word rape is appropriate or not. Uh, uh, there wasn't as much force as one might think. It was just a matter of uh, not verbally asking them for anything, but just uh, making the motions, and uh, the two girls submitted right away to all of us. Uh, uh, I got uh, what you might call disgusted after a while and kind of could see myself doing what I was doing and the situation as it was, and uh, I felt uh, a tremendous sense of guilt right there. Uh, I started to walk away while a couple of the other GIs were standing around watching what was happening. And uh, I heard 
couple M16 bursts, and uh, two girls were, were shot right there when they were laying on the ground. One of them was sitting, one of them was laying on the ground. Afterwards, it was... Uh, uh, I, I did feel like, like there should have been some kind of uh, punishment right there. Not, it was almost a religious thing, you know, I wanted some, uh, you know, God to stop me, you know, right there or something, but it didn't happen. That was the first time I thought of war crime, you know, war crime, I'm a war criminal, and uh, what have I done, you know. Not in, in the context of can I get in trouble for it, I wasn't worried about whether or not, I, as a matter of fact, I, I kind of maybe wanted to get in trouble for it. You know, because out of the guilt for, for doing it. But I kept asking myself, what, uh, I mean, I was allowed to do this. There was a non-commissioned officer present. He, he participated too. But I did re-enlist that thought in mind, thought of deserting. So I did go home on that 30-day leave. Uh, I didn't, I found myself unable to talk to anybody about it. I didn't tell one soul at all when I got home that I'd thought of deserting. As far as everybody was concerned, I'd just gotten a, a leave as some kind of reward. Uh, and I was at home for a while, and I'd have to go, to be, go back to Vietnam. This is what all my friends and family thought. Uh, I went to my wife. Um, and I did go to her and see her. I, I went to her with the thought in mind of, of telling her that I plan on deserting and then asking her to go with me. I just chickened out. I couldn't do it. I just kind of closed my eyes, turned my back, took a deep breath, and got on a train for Canada. Someday, the, the war cry of testimony that I'm gathering from the deserters will, will surface into the straight news media somehow. I don't know. Uh, it's all out of the sense of guilt I have. I have to admit that for what I did, for what I saw, and also the disappointment I have in my, in my home, my mother country, I might say. Several weeks after this interview was filmed, Jerry Samuels attempted suicide and later returned to the United States where he gave himself up to the military. Ken Powell, a Seventh-day Adventist from a small desert community in Nevada, now works for room and board on a farm 40 miles outside Toronto. When he refused to go to Vietnam, Ken was court-martialed and sent to the Fort Ord stockade. He tells what happened to him there. The way of having fun was by beating me up and torturing me, you know, by dropping matches on my stomach, lighted matches and everything, you know. And uh, I don't know, I guess they just got a kick out of it, you know. I can't say that I'm happy. I can say that I uh, feel a lot better than I would be if I was back in the States in a stockade or in jail somewhere. Would you want to go back? Uh, I would if they'd grant me amnesty. Yes, I would. What of parents back home? The Taps share the loneliness and anguish of their son, Michael, who was in Canada. Uh, you asked about uh, our feeling about amnesty, and I think generally uh, the boys who took the stand and went into self-exile are only expressing the feelings of what now apparently has millions of other Americans who have felt for now for some years that the war was wrong, but these boys expressed themselves in the only way they could by actually severing their ties with this country, which was a decided wrench for them. What about the possibility of his returning and giving himself up? Well, that would be his decision uh, to make. But if that was his decision, of course, we would go along with him. But I think that he was as loyal a citizen as, as you could find anywhere. Amnesty legislation has been introduced in the Congress which would enable draft and military resistors to return to the United States without having to serve jail sentences. Representative Edward Koch, a Democrat well, from New York to, City, uh, was the first sponsor of this type of legislation. Here are his views. While the war was going on in 1969 and again in 1972, I introduced legislation which would have permitted the return of these draft resistors, providing that they do two years of civilian service. Now that the war is uh, over, we have to expand that, and that is what I am for. 
Senator Edward Kennedy's subcommittee on administrative practices and procedures opened hearings on the possibility of an amnesty this past March, 72. Here are excerpts from those hearings. What we must ask is whether the nation wants to offer reconciliation to a generation of young Americans, to their families, to their communities, whether we are strong enough to be compassionate and understanding, whether we have enough faith in our marketplace of ideas to welcome minds that have disagreed with us, whether our own commitment to a generation of peace is firm enough to include peace with our own children. These are the questions we'll discuss today. And we feel that this discussion of amnesty at this time encourages desertion, and even worse, makes the efforts of those that continue to risk their lives subject to ridicule. Before you gentlemen decide to give or not give amnesty, I think you should understand why people such as myself became criminals in the first place. I can't speak for the thousands of young people in this country that now live outside the law, but I can speak for myself. I would ask you to open your heart to the words of Ecclesiastes. To everything there is a season and a time to every purpose under the heaven. A time to kill and a time to heal. A time to break down and a time to build up. We've had our time of killing and now must prepare ourselves for the time of healing. This committee would be better engaged in suggesting and designing a memorial to the over 50,000 military men who died believing in this country's cause. Well, Mr. Kelly, you've given us a very powerful um, uh, testimony this morning, and I know that uh, you speak your heart and you speak with great uh, concern, and obviously given this a great deal of uh, thought, and there are many Americans who, who share that, that view. Henry Schwarzschild of the American Civil Liberties Union is coordinating efforts to include military deserters in amnesty legislation. To extend an amnesty only to draft evaders and to discriminate against deserters would mean to compound the class and race discrimination that the draft and the war has already accentuated. Poor people, less well-educated people, minority people, have been drafted and have fought and died in this war in disproportionate numbers. The motivations for refusing to participate in the war by means of draft evasion or desertions are essentially the same. And it would be a, a bitter irony if we were able to bring about a reconciliation of America with the Chinese people and the Vietnamese people without also reconciling ourselves with those members of the young generation war resistors who, are, who fall into many categories, draft evaders and deserters, and those who've been convicted by military courts and those who've been given less than honorable discharges, if we could not reconcile ourselves with those members of that young generation and welcome them back into our society as well. Why do you think that the American people should give an amnesty to these draft resistors and deserters? It would be a tragedy, I think, for them, but more importantly for American society at large not to have them return to this society after the war and help create with all of us a more decent and just society. But what's going to happen to the tens of thousands of deserters? As things stand now, if they give themselves up and return to the United States, they face military prosecution and the stockade. At Fort Dix, most of the men in the stockade are those who have gone AWOL or have deserted and have been apprehended. Major C.W. Cawley deals daily with the problems of AWOLs and deserters. On his return, uh, of course, there'll have to be a process through our judicial system, of course, military. And uh, ordinarily, he would arrive at an, org an organization similar to what we have here, a personal control facility. Do you think that sometimes political motives can be justification for causing them to leave? And that's what I was thinking originally. Uh, say five years ago when we first started uh, the big buildup in Vietnam and so forth, and many people went across into Canada. And uh, my first impression on this was that uh, politics had very little to do with the reason why they didn't want to go to Vietnam or serve in the service. Well, a lot of them really uh, 
have a belief that uh, politically they are correct and that what they've done is, is justifiable along those lines. And uh, I can only say that's their opinion and I perhaps have mine. Just what kind of treatment can a man expect when he returns? I can only say that whatever happens to them when they come back isn't going to be the most terrible thing in the world. As a matter of fact, it'll be the beginning of a new day for most of them. Even if they are put in the stockade? Uh, even if they're put in the stockade, you've, you've hit me with that before. Uh, for some reason or other, somebody thinks the stockade is a terrible place. It is not necessarily the most terrible place in the world. So you would recommend that men should come back and face up to whatever they have to to get back in the Army? Oh, most definitely. Most definitely. I'd say to anyone in Canada that uh, come back as soon as possible, that nothing here is so terrible that uh, you can't come back. After all, uh, this is still their home, and uh, they're going to be looked at that way and be taken care of. No problem. Various forms of amnesty have been proposed that would include one or the other, or all of the resistors, deserters, and those now in jail. Melvin Laird, former Secretary of Defense, took this position on the question of amnesty. Well, of course, as far as our country is concerned, throughout the entire history of our country, we have always uh, considered violations of the law and tried to temper justice with mercy. And that's been the whole history of every president has had to face up to those tough, difficult decisions. But in the administration of justice in the United States, we've always administered, administered justice with a degree of mercy, which is important. On your question, I do not believe now is the time to consider that question of amnesty. That question should not be considered until every young American has been returned from the prisoners of war camps, or we have a complete accounting for every man missing in action in accordance with the Geneva Conventions and even the enemy has signed those conventions and refuses to abide by them. While there is a single American involved in combat operations and being drafted into our service and going to serve his country in accordance with the laws of this nation, this is not the time for us to consider that question. We reject the current Leaders of the war exile community in Canada advocate general unconditional amnesty. At a press conference in Toronto, they rejected several of the amnesty proposals. They all have a punitive string attached called alternative service, and they all imply guilt on our part when we were the ones who refused to commit the crime. What we are talking about is a totally non-punitive restoration of complete civil liberty for all persons charged, persons who might be charged, and or persons convicted under any American municipal, state, federal, and or military law due to actions related directly or indirectly to the Indochina War. Since our first interview with Dick Burroughs, he has acquired a family in Canada. Now he faces the complex choice about amnesty. What would you do if there was an amnesty? Uh, would you want to go back? Well, it depends on what, what kind of amnesty. If it's, if it's punitive at all, uh, I'd have a hard time. I would really like to go back, but, uh, you know, I, I would find it very difficult to, to compromise, you know, by, by accepting a punitive amnesty, particularly one that's like three years. Faced with the dilemma of violating the Selective Service Law or violating what to them were moral imperatives against participation in a war they saw as evil, they chose prison or exile. And as we do, we might well ponder the Easter sermon of the late Cardinal Cushing. And I quote, Would, Would it, it be, be too, too much, much to, suggest to suggest that we empty out our jails of all the protesters, the guilty and the innocent, without judging them? Call back from over the border and around the world young men who are called deserters? Drop the cases that are still awaiting judgment on our college youth? Could we do all of this 
in the name of life, and with life, hope, wherever our young people, even for reasons we do not know, stand in need of mercy. Let us reach out to them. Both the Interreligious Conference on Amnesty and the National Council of Churches have urged that we view amnesty not as a matter of forgiveness, pardon, or clemency, but as a blessed act of oblivion, the law's own way of undoing what the law itself has done. By granting amnesty and providing opportunities for those hurt by war in Indochina, we would begin to repair some of the damage to our nation inflicted by that war. Your military, let's go!